this coil here and this one come up over an archway here so as not to block the, what's called the breather of the washer. This is a hollow square section mu metal inductor core. This is like one of those washers he had on his uh, particle board. See how it wraps around one washer? There's a little gap in it. Now for the coil going up the rod in the center, we have this one here and this one here. What he did was he used pulsed direct current to generate a spinning vortex right here in the fabric of space, if you wish, into the ether space. I'm going to show you how that works in the next animation. But this, I promise you, is a 30-foot diameter craft drive coil. It produces a number of very interesting effects on the crew and the surrounding area by altering time. It's not a time machine. It just simply means that for people inside the field at various positions from the center and out, time passes at a different rate. While I'm on that subject very quickly, if you watch a hummingbird, or watch a bee, you'll see that they move a lot quicker than you can predict where they're going or try to catch one or a fly. These things operate at a higher operative neural rate than you and I do, yet they do function. They are simply looking at us as slow, sluggish, moving things, and they are just living five to ten times faster than us. With these craft, when the energy is pumped into this and into the superstructure and into the crew, all their atoms, all their molecules get extra energy and they become like the hydrogen atom in a hot air or a hydrogen balloon type thing. They become inertially lighter, but yet they are moving faster. So when they go to do one of these miraculous right angle turns at 10,000 miles an hour that are impossible, they have not violated the rules of physics at all. What they have done is they've said, uh, attention crew, we're going to turn a corner uh, about 10,000 miles an hour here, prepare. And somebody in the crew says, okay, you got the cards? Yeah, okay, I'll get something to drink, get up a table. And they're now going to turn the corner. And it takes them five minutes, let's say, to turn that corner. But you on the outside see, that's impossible. It would rip apart. But it's not because everything in here is at a different energy density like that hummingbird. And they are being uniformly accelerated. And as they go around that corner, they're looking out the window, well, sometimes, and they're saying, oh, look, everybody's in slow motion. <sighs> And they lose 10 minutes of their life relative to you. Or the game, sorry, the game. They, in other words, they, they age at 10 minutes while you're only aging a fraction of a second. It's like when you were at the fairgrounds, the showgrounds. As a kid, they used to have this big cylinder that you'd uh, stand on and have a floor and it'd start to spin. Then all of a sudden, a floor would drop out and somebody across you, you know, you'd all stick to the edge of it and spin sideways, stuck on the side of it. And somebody would usually, you know, wet their pants or something, get really excited. Uh, because there's no floor under them. But what it is, is the centrifuge effect is holding you up. Now, if you extrapolate that to a ball instead of a cylinder, and you have a ball with oil in it and another ball inside that, and you're inside that ball, and somebody pushes you off a 50-story building. I wouldn't try it, but anyway, hypothetically, what would happen is your double spheres with oil would hit the ground, bounce, you being inside that ball and, and lopsided because you're not, you, your weight's not uniformly distributed would cause the inner ball to spin. And what would happen is it, the big ball on the outside would come to a rest in somebody's parking lot or something down there and people would listen, they'd hear <laughs> going on inside. And after a few minutes, you in the inside spinning ball, like at the fairgrounds, would come to a stop. And what you have done is you've stretched out the period of time that you normally would take to crash into the dirt and kill yourself over several minutes, and that doesn't cause structural fatigue. When I was at the academy here, the Air Force Academy, uh, we used to de describe a crash of an aircraft as a landing in which the vertical component was reduced to zero in such a short period of time as to cause structural fatigue. <laughs> that wouldn't happen in this kind of a situation. These things are not only possible, they're being done. And they've been done behind your back for very good reasons, which we'll certainly address before we get through here today. Now, do any of you um, ever recall in the um, late 50s, early 60s, um, it wasn't Dino Kraspadon. There was a, a, a science fiction writer, not a science fiction writer, a UFO investigator back then. 
mentioning the the guy that knew the secret, the military guy named Lorenzo that knew the secret about the flying saucers. Do you remember that? Probably not. Well, anyway, it was a rumor in the UFO community back then that there was some guy that had the secret to anti-gravity that knew it, and he was in control of all this for the military, and his name was Lorenzo. Probably a captain or something, they weren't sure. It wasn't a Mr. Lorenzo. It was what is called a Lorenz, L-O-R-E-N-T-Z, O. What you just saw up here makes what is called a Lorentz O. The secret to the anti-gravity problem uh, or situation is the Lorentz O. Named after a mathematician Lorentz, um, it uh, tells what happens when you have electricity going this way in a conductor, and at the same time you have electricity going around it to make like this in a different direction. In between them a force appears, whether in air, water, whatever, and it's called the Lorentz force. And it tries to get these two conductors to line up. And if you don't let them, then the stress has to be uh, transferred to the medium you're in, anti-gravity. Now this device here, I uh, built to show people. <laughs> We're going to see that little thing over here on the left animate. And um, I'm going to show you a long quartz tube. And inside it will be a copper um, pipe, uh, a thin pipe of copper, lining the inside of this tube. And then I'm going to put a nail and a cork right down the middle of it, and I'm going to take electricity from a electric arc welder, 1200 watts at about 60 volts. And I'm going to shove that down through that nail, through some salt water, which is just tap water with a bit of salt, a couple of tablespoons of salt, and some hydrochloric acid to make it conductive. And it's going to go through that water into this copper sheath, which is then connected to the other end of the copper tube back to the um, uh, electric arc welder. You'll see all this. I'm telling you beforehand so that uh, you can just contemplate what you're seeing. What you're going to see at the end of all this is that scene right there where I have a copper tube with all this, um, and the glass tube with all this uh, water in it, sitting right down inside of two speaker magnets. You know, the back of your speakers, those round donut magnets? They have a north-south field running like this, which is the same as one of those washer coils that I was showing you before. And when I do that, and I just do nothing but pit, hit the power switch and electricity starts to flow down from that uh, nail you see at the top down to the copper, you're going to see spin. And that's the beginning of the vortex tornado, the Lorentz O. And you can use that to make plasma craft and anti-gravity craft. You can also use it in water at lower temperatures to make very fast boats. That's when I was a little bit younger. Well, maybe a lot. There's your, um, well, that might be brass. I can't tell from the color. It was brass or copper, just a conductor. Quartz too, because this gets very hot very quickly. Glove, obviously, to keep from burning myself again. There's your ring magnets. There's the uh, jar of water from the tap. Still water is better than you put a couple of tablespoons of salt and about, oh, half an ounce of hydrochloric or something in it. That's a company that made the uh, electric arc welder. That's a 100 amp diode down there which turns the alternating current into one direction, direct current. And there's the, the magic nail that goes down through the cork. I forget what we made that out of, but it was something that didn't melt easy. And here you go. No moving parts except the bubbles that form from the heat showing where the ions are traveling following the, the vortex field set up. And this occurs down the center of any of those craft. The next time you're sitting next to somebody blowing smoke rings, witness a miracle. The smoke ring can do some marvelous things. If you stand here in this room and put up, say, an elephant ear plant back there, you know, those big green ears float like that, or a candle, a lit candle, and you went <laughs> as hard as you could huff and puff, you could not blow out the candle or move the big elephant ear back there, the plant. Yet, if you take a device that makes a smoke ring 
and you use the same amount of energy, probably less, and you aim it back there and you go like that. That little ring of energy, the same amount that you would have blown out and lost into oblivion out here, same amount in a tight little package goes right over there and blows out a candle or moves that target elephant ear like that. Now, in this test here, I've used slow speed, and some of it I've, I've done some time lap or some uh, slow mo camera stuff. But watch, as you see there, there's a smoke ring on the right, but behind it, from the inside, is a long cylinder of smoke. These crafts that we're talking about, this technology, and a number of other technologies that they use, including plasma beams, all rely.